Right, good morning everyone. It's uh, early March and uh, I'm doing some my first bit of filming for the Quarter website in ages, so uh, hopefully it's going to go well. We're at a lake called Bluntsmere, uh, which is on the Chelmsford Angling Ticket in Essex. So basically it's a lovely old snaggy little pit, um, loads of lovely fish in here and hopefully throughout the day I'm going to catch a couple. Um, I've challenged myself to just use the one rod. There's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, when you snag fishing, two rods can be a bit of a pain. You know, if you've got a fish on a bank and the rod goes, it's just a bit... You're, you know, if you can do it, you're better off fishing with one rod. Um, and I think today, one rod, fingers crossed, will be enough. I'm sort of all ready to go, really. I've got the rod clipped up nice and early because you know, I don't want to be messing around throughout the day. So I've done that. I've done my casts, got the rod clipped up, measured it around the signet distance sticks, put it in the clip. You know, it's all ready to go. So it's there for the rest of the day. That's, I can go back to that whenever I need to and get the rod out nice and smoothly. So all that's left to do now is bait a rig and get one in position. So that's exactly what I'm going to do now. Right, rod's in position. Uh, it took about three or four casts, but when you're casting into that little cave like that, it's better to be safe than sorry. You know, if it looks like it's going to go in a tree, do your best to stop it. Stop it early. Um, yeah, so the rod's out. I basically put a pop-up rig out there. It's nice and clean and gravelly, but I'm sure if you actually swam under there and had a look, there'd be all bits and pieces over the gravel. So just a pop-up to keep it out of the way. Right hook bait, and I've spread about 30, 40 cell over the rig and just around the edges, just into the snags. The idea being, you know, with the baits in the snags, just that they eat those and then they follow the trail to the hook bait. So that's the theory. The uh, rod's in position, locked up nice and tight. You know, I'm snag fishing, so clutch is zipped up. Half drop on the bobbin. Sensitivity's turned up on the alarm, and uh, we're rocking, ready to go. All we need now is a uh, carp to venture out the snag and uh, eat my little picnic bait. Right, well, fortunately that didn't take too long. It's probably been out there about 15 minutes. Um, one thing I must stress when you're doing this sort of fishing, like you have to pick the rod up and pull as hard as you can. Once they're away from the trees, you know, like I'm doing now, you can take your time. Um, but for the initial part of the fight, you can't mess around, you know. The, your one aim is to get the fish away from the trees um, and it's worked perfectly, you know. And here he is. Well, here he is. Not the biggest carp in the lake, but certainly a lovely little fella. Poor thing didn't stand a chance in the old tug of war. But uh, yeah, let's get this one back. There's plenty of uh, slightly bigger fish in here. So hopefully the next one will be this one's big brother. Right, the rod's back in position. Um, probably been out there about 20 minutes or so now, and you know I've rebaited. I rebaited as soon as I got the fish in the net. Put some more bait out. Um, just to build their confidence, that sort of thing. But yeah, rig's back in position and I'm getting liners, so definitely fish there. I've probably had 10 liners or so now. So uh, I'm sat on my chair, I'm sat right next to the rod. It's obviously really important. If you're gonna snag fish, you need to be on the rod as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, hopefully in a minute, one of these little bleeps is gonna uh, turn into something a little bit more savage. Well, it was probably about five seconds after I did that last bit to camera, willing the rods to go um, before, you know, it did exactly what I was hoping. Bobbin smashed into the top and the rod wrapped round. And uh, this one, I think, is a little bit bigger. He certainly, uh, he certainly pulled a bit harder around the bushes. And uh, yeah, he's sending up some nice big vortexes out in the middle, so. Might have a bigger one, I think. All right, I'm taking it nice and easy now. He's, uh, he's away from danger, you know, he's nowhere near the trees. And you know, you don't, you don't need to pull the reds off unless you absolutely have to. So, hand him nice and gently. And yeah, he's, he's 
he's putting up a good account. He is, he's going, he's going strong. Another lovely little common. Massive rubbery lips on him, this one. You see him in the net, just big old white lips hanging right out the front of his face. Puck a little fish. But yeah, like I say, he fought a bit harder this one, so I may as well talk to you about the rig in a minute before I get the rod cast back out, because uh, you know when you're doing this sort of fishing, the rigs you're using, the hooks, that sort of thing, you know, they can be absolutely crucial to uh, your hooked and landed ratio, and obviously you want to be hooking as many as you can and landing them all as well. So we'll get this one back, and then, uh, like I say, I'll run you through the rig. Right, so this is the rig. Um, like I said earlier, it's basically a variation of the hinge stiff link. It sort of works in a similar sort of way. So you've got a boom section uh, and then the hook section. So I'll run, I'll run through it um, and I'll start with a pop-up. So bright pink pop, no, not bright, you know, nice pink pop-up. Um, really buoyant, but I've also drilled it out uh, and plugged it with cork. And basically, because I'm using a very large hook, I do find with some pop-ups, they tend to stop, sort of like lean over over time once they sort of absorb some water. Um, so that cork's in there, basically just to keep the buoyancy of the bait the same, you know, for as long a time as possible. Um, and obviously it holds the rig up nice and nice and straight. The, that's attached to a rig ring, which sits on a small D um, at the back of the hook, just, just above the eye. The hook itself is a size four choddy. Now, I use these a lot, you know, I use these all the time, basically with this rig, or any pop-up rig, I'll always use a size four choddy, but they're perfect for this sort of fishing, you know, they're, they're not gonna bend, they're not gonna snap, they're not going to tear out, you know, got a nice big gate. Basically, when that hook goes in, 99.9% .9 of the time, it goes in, it stays in, it doesn't move. Um, and in a situation like this, where, you know, you really have got a pull at times, um, that hook, you know, will just, it's the perfect hook, in my opinion, for the job. So, running down from that is 25 pound mouth trap, nice and stiff, keeps its shape, um, and basically, you know, is a key element to the hook section. Beneath that, right at the bottom there, there's a, some putty moulded around a knot, and the knot basically joins the 15 pound uh, soft end trap to the mouth trap. Um, so yeah, the putty's there to anchor the bait. Beneath that putty, there's a small supple section where I've removed the coating um, from the braid, and that's basically, you know, allows the, allows the rig some movement. Um, and when the hook section goes into the mouth, you know, I think that, that's key to the hook being able to do what it wants to do and finding a hole in the bottom lip. Running down the rig, like I said, it's 15 pound end trap soft. Um, and in sort of just, just under halfway down uh, from the top of the rig, there's a piece of putty and that basically helps to lay the rig out flat and, pin, and pins the whole lot down as well. And then at the top there, just a loop knot. Um, it's actually a grinner. I tie a grinner knot and tighten it down early. Um, it forms my loop and that is then attached to a helicopter leader. Um, and basically, the reason I'm using the helicopter, I'm not dropping the lead. Now, I know there's snags out there, but basically the snags, they don't go that deep into the water, they're on the surface, so I find, you drop the lead when you snag fishing. If the snags are all the way to the bottom, I'll always drop the lead, because there's absolutely no advantage to keeping the lead on. But if the snags only touch the surface, I prefer to keep the lead on, basically because the fish don't rise up. You know, if you drop the lead, they rise up in the water, they go into the branches. So, by using a helicopter rig with the lead kept on, uh, the fish stay low, and they don't tend, you know, very rare they actually lose any fish in the snags. They just tend to stay deep and move out of danger. 99 times out of 100, you know, this, this goes in, stays in, and uh, I'm able to pull the fish away from the snags without any danger. Well, I want to take this opportunity just to quickly talk you through um, the fact that, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'm using braids. I want to talk to you about that because some of you may not really, you know, may have never used it. Um, basically, I'm using it. It's called the Sub Braid, which is going to be released by a quarter. Oh, that's my... Right, so I'll carry on from where I left off. So, uh, it's the Sub Braid from Corder. Um, be released, I don't know, be released this year, I think. Um, but basically, 
braid has got absolutely no stretch in it. So it's awesome for several different scenarios in carp fishing. Um, I've used it a lot over the last year. Um, fish it in open water situation. You can use it for whatever, you know, it's not the best casting braid in the world, but you can still fish over a hundred yards of it. So it will cater for most of your needs. Um, like I say, lack of stretch. So not only can you use it as, you know, you can basically use your fishing rod as a marker rod, which has obviously got massive advantages. Um, cool, I'm out of breath. Uh, um, but this, for, for this sort of fishing, for the snag fishing, you know, I'm casting into those gaps in the back there. Um, and basically when you're clipping a rod up, a mono, a fluorocarbon, there's, all, there's a lim, um, element of stretch in both of them. So the difference with the braid is there's no stretch. So when you're casting in there, you're clipping up, it's, the rig isn't, you know, it's never changing. As long as you hit the clip, it will land exactly where you want it. Whereas with mono, you can get a bit of stretch and sometimes overcast, get yourself caught in the trees. So it's great in that sense, you know, it will always land exactly where you want it to, you know, to the inch. Um, playing fish in this sort of situation, so no stretch. So when you pick the rod up and pull, the fish has no choice but to come with you. And that is, you know, really, really valuable in this sort of fishing. If you're using a monofilament line, you know, the stretch alone can enable the fish to take you into the snags and basically a braid will prevent you from doing that. You're going to get the fish away from the snag and like I have here, you know, he's down in the edge now, nice and safe. Um, and something you might notice, and it's something I always do, is actually the knots just here. So just there, there's a basic, there's a join between the braid and the fluorocarbon. It's a fluorocarbon leader, probably about 12, 14 foot long. Basically that's just there as a little cushion, you know. If you've got braid all the way through, some people say you can suffer hook pulls, but I basically put that there just to disguise the braid, because it does, you know, the, it is quite visible in comparison to a fluoro. You know, fluoro is invisible, braid isn't. So that's there for a few reasons, just to cushion the fish while you're playing it, um, and also just a little bit of disguise just around the rig. So that's why I use the braid. It is really good stuff, it's perfect for this sort of fishing, um, but it's got a hell of a lot of other really good uses as well. So now, now I've done that, we'll uh, concentrate on getting this fish into it. Right, so that's three and three, three fish in a uh, three cast, which is, well, couldn't ask for more than that. Um, basically, the, I think the key to get, you know, getting the bite sort of as consistently and as, uh, you know, they're coming quite quick. It's basically, I'm, you know, I'm always feeding, so I'm putting just not a lot of bait, but 30, 40 baits out um, after every fish. Put the bait out there, and while the fish, you know, while I'm waiting to get the fish sorted, do these little bits to camera, and that the fish are able to go to the spot, have a little feed, um, and then if, basically, if I can get the rig back out there in sort of a couple of casts. I think basically as soon as they see that hook bait, they're straight on it, you know, they're feeding confidently. They're eating a lot of bait without getting caught. Um, yeah, and it's basically, it's making them easier to catch, you know. That's the same in any situation. If you can get them eating the bait without the fear of a rig being around, then when you do put one in place, you know, they they come in none the wiser and uh, this is the result. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I put a bait up just so I got this one in the net. So I'm gonna get him back and uh, get that rod back out there. Well, we're into number four, and this one, literally, I cast the rod out, I got done by a duck, so I reeled it in, uh, rechucked it, and, well, I don't know how long it had been out there, three seconds, the line was in my hands, rod, in, as you can see, it's uh, still in the line clip, um, yeah, it's gone straight away, which is uh, absolutely wonderful. All right, how about that then? That's what I'm talking about. Lovely, lovely carp. I reckon he's, I reckon it's a 20 pounder, but we'll call it 19 because I haven't got my scale, so I can't weigh him. And uh, don't want to be seen to be rounding him up. So we'll round him down to call him 19 pound, but what a lovely, lovely fish. And uh, I actually caught this one on a bottom bait. I had a duck uh, constantly diving on the spot. In the end, he picked the rig up and um, 
when I reeled it in to redo it, I blunted the hook. I've been getting liners just before that, so I knew the fish were there. So stuck a real simple bottom bait rig on, just, you know, braid and a size six wide gape. Flicked it out there, and uh, like I said in the fight, it was not, it was probably out there three or four seconds before it actually uh, before it got picked up. You know, line was still in the clip, and uh, this is the result. Lovely, lovely carp, like I said several times now. I must like him, so I keep repeating myself. But uh, lovely way to finish the day. I'm well chuffed.